So if you take Amtrak 7,800 miles around the U.S., you're bound to learn a few things. The first thing I learned is about packing. Every backpacker's first mistake is overpacking, and I failed that on this trip. From the full-on camping gear and stove, to the bike, to the laptop and filmmaking kit, I was a mess. Half the trip, my hands were too full of stuff to take any good pictures and videos. I tried to get on the train in Boston and immediately was told I had to drive three hours to Albany. That taught me to be careful of making bike reservations for each trip. So I did what every YouTuber does, call their mom and ask for a ride. I actually got in the train. I quickly learned that any Amtrak east of Chicago is less luxury liner and more utilitarian people mover. But yet, there I was, curling up in a sleeping bag with no pillow and a mandatory face covering. I managed to survive the first night, and any elation I felt from my morning coffee was quickly counteracted by my introduction to my new nemesis, the bathroom. But I wouldn't let that stop me. Enjoy the early morning views of the Midwest farmscape. My train was going to arrive several hours late in Chicago, and instead of a casual layover, I was going to have a desperate dash for food and photos in just 90 minutes. Most train stations have a pretty entrance hall that's nice for photos, but only a few have a comfortable place to wait for your train. What you gotta realize when you get on one of Amtrak's Superliner trains, like the Empire Builder that I'm about to board here, is that these things are beasts. And in that train hall, it is sweaty, gross, and nasty. But I will say, once you get on, the atmosphere instantly changes. It is completely smooth and relaxing. With the help of about $40 in Italian food, I melted in my seat as Chicago turned into Milwaukee, Milwaukee turned into suburbs, and suburbs turned into the Mississippi River. This milestone coincided with the first of many train gears, as well as a study of the Mississippi River's Wikipedia page. Now you may feel like that's boring, but what you gotta realize is that I'm gonna be on this train for 28 hours until I reach western Montana, so I'm scraping everywhere I can for interesting ways to pass the time. One of the most interesting things you can do in the train is talk to your fellow passengers, learning where they're going, where they're coming from, and sharing stories along the way. During one of the train's periodic smoke breaks, where the crew takes out the trash, I met a couple of people traveling to a bachelor party who offered me to share in their 28-hour pregame. I couldn't resist the early morning ambiance of the observation car, and the train got full in the afternoon too, so it was worth it. When you're in coach, it's almost a guarantee that you'll be sharing a seat with a stranger. Pretty much the best and only thing to do on the train is crush the snack bar and take in slices of everyday life around the country. From historical signposts to geographical features, football practice, and modern industries, every mile offers something. The crew changes offer a chance to get an elongated picture of that everyday life. However, most of that time is spent waiting in the line of the nearest business and worrying about when the train's all aboard call will come. No matter how good the views, 48 hours riding trains takes a toll on the mind and body. What kept me going was a little bit of wine and opportunities for a crew change where I got a few minutes to run around a new location.
You'll never know a place like Shelby, Montana from 30,000 feet, home to some of the best gas station chili I've ever had. When the mountains first appeared on the horizon, I knew my time was coming. The area around Glacier National Park, including Whitefish, Montana, is a great jumping off point for just about any outdoor adventure you can think of. So easy that it's literally impossible to mess it up. I opted for a campsite that cost $12 a night and had what would have been considered a boutique cafe less than 100 yards from my tent in an area that I thought would be the middle of nowhere. In the park, I didn't have a reservation and I still got a pass on the free shuttle. Park rangers gave me a good hiking trail to take. I had great views, non-dangerous wildlife, and had a chance to even go swimming before the end of the day. My recommendations are spending a day hiking the High Line Trail and take the gravel road up to Pole Bridge, a small outpost on the North Fork River just 10 miles from the Canadian border. An eclectic crew of adventurers gathers around Pole Bridge's three buildings, the saloon, mercantile, and hostel where I was able to stay. The Amtrak trip from the east to Glacier and the activities in the park were worth doing on its own. I was satisfied with my efforts on the trip and ready to return home. However, I was only just getting started. All those adventures around the park had me exhausted and I couldn't wait to get back on the train. I was in for more than just epic views on this train ride. A brutal surprise met me when I found out that trains from Oregon, my destination, southbound into California, were canceled due to the wildfires that were currently going on that had also made the sky smoky since we crossed the Mississippi. With an improbable twist of good luck, a conversation with a fellow Amtrak Rail Pass traveler got me an opportunity to travel in a rented car from Portland down to Sacramento, road tripping along the Oregon coast, bypassing the wildfire cancellations. This impromptu road trip turned into one of the most incredible parts of the trip. Just like anywhere, if you zoom in close, you, huh? there'll be some bad parts. But in my mind, the Oregon coast is exquisite. Some of the people I met had this really quirky sense of humor that made the place even more unique and special.
This was peak off-script travel. Another day, another adventure. This time, Northern California. I'm not quite sure which one to talk about. How awesome the trees are in this part of the country, or how unignorable the low water levels and smoky air were. Maybe it's just East Coast bias, but I'm yet to understand how West Coasters come to terms with the danger they're constantly in of fire, mudslide, earthquake, and volcano. Okay, I understand that not all of those affect everybody simultaneously, but if you had the choice, why wouldn't you choose the other one? Ever wonder why Sacramento is the capital of California instead of San Francisco or Los Angeles? Well, my friend, it's because of the railroads. Much of the railroad's history is extremely well curated at the California State Railroad Museum. It's located not far from the train station in the historically preserved neighborhood known as Old Sac. I wonder how many Stanford students know what kind of practices their namesake founder used to employ labor on the railroads. Things were certainly a lot different back then, but the effects of those decisions impact society every day. Meanwhile, my manifest destiny rewarded me with a double chili cheeseburger and garlic fries. And finally, I was back on the train, headed to Emeryville, my departure point for my eastbound route, the California Zephyr. I did spend about 48 hours in the Bay Area, but my good planning luck eventually ran out and ended up with only a few good quality video snippets from this part of the trip. San Francisco does have the largest Chinatown in North America, and whenever you're in Chinatown, you best be going to dim sum. But anyway, it was back to the train and time to head east. The Zephyr's ride out of California through the Sierra Nevada mountains is one of the most iconic parts of an Amtrak journey comes with your own narrator, John, the legendary train host. America that serves the population and the community of Winnemucca. Wow. I'm John, I'm going to be your train host throughout the state of California. In fact, I'll be with you until we do have a crew change, which takes place in Reno, Nevada. So I will keep you up to date on our progress and point out some of the sights seen on the left that grade the sun, which can hold up to 1,200 new cars. At the port, the cars are transferred onto New Jersey City. John's presence was a reminder that Amtrak travel is a living, breathing part of American history. America's present, just like its past, is full of triumph and tragedy. Just like there are great views and not as great ones in the train, there are great experiences you can have in this country and not as great ones.
I am extremely lucky and privileged to have the opportunity to travel for fun. And on this trip, I was thankful for it every day. For my coach car and my upright, uncomfortable seat that I slept in night after night, I felt like I received a slice of America. And it wasn't sugar-coated at all. It was raw and wriggling, befitting of how chaotic these last few years have been. I genuinely thought the Nevada desert would never end, but it did, and I was met with the Green River as I moved through Utah towards Colorado. I messed up badly and brought no food with me on this leg of the trip. My bag of supplies was sitting in my friend's living room several hundred miles west. Fortunately, I found salvation at a crew change in Grand Junction. When I arrived in Glenwood Springs, the world's largest hot springs pool, containing over a million gallons of water, was ready to cure any soreness I had picked up in the last 28 hours on the train. Look at that rainbow sun! The road to Aspen starts here. I took advantage of the local network of bike trails to ride my squeaky bike 38 miles to Aspen. This ride brought me in touch with old and new. A little bit of natural, a little bit of rugged, and a whole lot of bougie when I got to Aspen. My favorite part about some of Colorado's fancier towns, like Aspen and Boulder, is that it's hard to tell the difference between a vagrant and a really chill rich guy. Me, being more of the former than the latter, missed out on most of the highlights of modern Aspen, and took the bus back to my campsite to make ramen after the rain stopped. While I was able to keep my gear dry despite the rain, when I did decide to treat myself to a nice meal, I managed to ruin it by trying to take slow-mo video. Say what you want about my aesthetic choices. I was a savvy veteran of Amtrak rides at this point. Packing well, bringing my own food, and knowing the best places to get the best views. The slow paced train across western landscapes was perfectly fine when I didn't have anywhere to be. But this time I had a date. I was meeting my girlfriend who'd flown in from Boston. And we had a road trip planned to Arches and Canyonlands National Park, just outside of Moab, Utah, about a four and a half hour drive from Salt Lake City. Except for the bathrooms, which typically leave much to be desired at national parks, both Arches and Canyonlands offer great opportunities to view and experience Utah's unique geography. In my opinion, Arches is more like a museum, with short, well-marked hikes to these iconic namesake arches throughout the park, and Canyonlands is more of an adventure with less defined trails and a more open, rugged landscape, encompassing much more terrain.
My time in Utah was short and sweet. Just like that, I was in the Salt Lake City train station at 4 in the morning with a ladybug crawling on me. It was time for my final push through the mountains. Passing Glenwood Springs, running parallel with Interstate I-90, I got to see firsthand how absurd Colorado is. The state of Colorado's population has nearly tripled since 1960, and combined with these big-ass mountains, I'm not surprised there's logistical issues. This is definitely the most intense part of the trip. For the sake of making this video move a little faster, I'm going to jump right into the rest of my trip back east. I will just add that the folks at their Amtrak station in Denver were really nice, making life easy for me getting my bike on and off the train. Shout out to all the Amtrak staff in general who were extremely nice throughout my trip. But let it be known, the system they use to manage bookings is total crap. My next leg was a rumble through some of the flattest terrain I'd ever seen through Nebraska and Iowa, onto Chicago, then through Appalachia onto DC. Sleeping upright in a coach seat never really felt right, and the only thing keeping me going each morning was waking up to a new part of the country. This morning, on my last morning ever waking up on the train, was Appalachia. The hilly terrain, dense forests, and sprawling towns and villages really were mysterious and felt like they had a unique call to me. However, as it goes in the train, you don't exactly go fast, but you always keep going. The mists of Appalachia soon turned to the rolling hills of Maryland, and eventually the iconic skyline of the nation's capital, Washington, D.C. I had time enough in D.C. to stretch my legs on a bike ride across the National Mall. But let's be honest here, what happens in D.C. is so far removed from American realities that this was more like visiting a museum as well. As my trip concluded, I wondered to myself what the point really was. I had traversed nearly 8,000 miles of road, rails, and trails. But for what? Well, I had a good time, and that's worth something. And I also learned a lot about what it means to be American in 2022. And that's a lot more complicated than I really thought. So go ahead and book that train ticket, but realize it won't be all sunshine and rainbows. As my final train passed through the sprawling northeast megalopolis, I commemorated the conclusion of my trip with Amtrak's iconic Hebrew National hot dog and a shot of whiskey. Absolutely, bar none, the most disgusting meal I ate at any point on my 28 days of travel. And finally I was home. Just enough time to grab one last shot of the train and get ready for a real night's sleep in a real bed. <laughs>